this is the 100th message in a series on the person and work of Christ. And we are currently endeavoring to set forth the gospel of the finished work of Christ as seen in the Old Testament scriptures. <clears throat> at this particular point, we are looking at the gospel in the great day of atonement in Leviticus 16. And this is the third such message on that precious portion of scripture. So first of all, we'll turn to Leviticus 16. I'm going to read some selected verses. Selected because there are portions of this chapter with which we will not concern ourselves tonight. And also, if you will study this chapter carefully, you will find that it repeats itself in a couple of places, backtracks over things that have already been mentioned, and tends to be just a little confusing. So in order to keep the record straight, I'm going to read some selected verses beginning at verse 3 of Leviticus 16. <coughs> Pardon me. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now at verse 15, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household, and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord, and make an atonement for it, and shall take of the blood of the bullock, and of the blood of the goat, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Verse 21, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the ha head of the live goat, and confess over him, all the iniquities of the children of Israel <clears throat> and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, and put on his garments, and come forth, and offer his burnt offering, and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself and for the people. Leviticus 16 is filled with the precious person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first thing to see and to remember is that Christ is the fulfillment of all of it. He is all 
all of the sacrifices of this chapter. He is the bullet. He is the burnt offering. He is the sin goat. He is the scapegoat. He is the sweet incense that filled the hand of the priest and filled the censer when he went into the holy place. He is the altar that was sprinkled with blood. He is the mercy seat that was sprinkled with blood. He is the Ark of the Covenant. He is the priest, the priest who was anointed, consecrated to the office, chosen and named specifically by God, empowered and accepted to come into the Holy of Holies and make the sacrifice for the people. We see Christ fulfilled in the person of the priest. We see all of the sacrifices in their fulfillment in his one great sacrifice. And we see in the various things which this priest accomplished and which this sacrifice procured all of the atoning work of the Lord Jesus. The book of Hebrews is the inspired book of the New Testament, which is the commentary to all that took place on the great day of atonement. And in the book of Hebrews, the apostle Paul plainly tells us that we have a high priest. And it was this high priest, Jesus, who entered a heavenly tabernacle with a better blood than the blood of goats and bulls, and went into a holy place greater than the holy place of the earthly tabernacle, and sprinkled the mercy seat which obtained for us an eternal redemption. There is a passage in this inspired book in Hebrews which I think shows clearly the work of the priest on the great day of atonement. And tonight I want to preach on that work of the priest on the great day of atonement and see in him the person and work of the Lord Jesus. So if you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 9, I'd like to read at verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, that is, animal sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, and I'm reading correctly, in the consummation of the ages, or in the end of the ages, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. There are three distinct appearances of the priest in this passage of Scripture. The first one in verse 26 tells us that he appeared once in the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And I don't know whether you ever connected before verse 27 with his appearance. But since it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, when Christ appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, it was necessary for him to die that he might go to judgment and take those sins with him. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And where did he bear them? He bore them to judgment after his death and so removed them as the sins were laid upon the head of the scapegoat and removed to the uninhabited place. 
The second appearance is in verse 24, where he appears now in heaven itself in the presence of God for us. And the third appearance of the Lord Jesus in this passage is let yet future. It is in that time, verse 28 says, when those who look for him shall see him appear the second time, and they will see him without sin unto salvation. And if you will lay this passage like a template down over the 16th chapter of Leviticus, you will see all of the work of the high priest on the great day of atonement in this precious passage about Jesus. Yes, you will even see the sin goat and the scapegoat, for it is appointed unto man once to die, and there is the sin goat, but after this the judgment, and there is the scapegoat. First of all, I want to talk to you about his first appearance before the people on the great day of atonement and what that day meant to the priest. This appearance is found in Leviticus 16, verse 4. His first appearance on the great day of atonement before the people was to appear with the holy linen coat, the linen breeches, the linen girdle, the linen miter, with his flesh washed with water. I tried to think of the great day of atonement from the standpoint of the priest. To him it was the great day, too. It was the day toward which all of his existence and all of his ministry had pointed. All that he had done previous to the great day of atonement led up to that day. And everything that he did after the great day of atonement pointed backward to it. For the priest himself, it was the greatest day of his life. It was the greatest day of his existence. It was indeed, as the writer of Hebrews says, the end or the consummation of the ages. All time in the priest's ministry looked forward to that great day of atonement when he would appear before the people and then appear before God, then appear again before the people to return to the tabernacle and accomplish an eternal redemption for God's people. And I submit to you that the great day of atonement at Calvary, when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to the people in the end of the ages, that great day when he obtained eternal redemption for us was the greatest day of the Lord Jesus' existence. It was the day to which all previous days pointed, and it was the day upon which all future time shall look toward again. He was the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, and before the universe and its ages were thrown down in chronological and logical order. Calvary was a fact in the mind of God. The great day of atonement was set before the Lord Jesus Christ, and all of the eternal ages that were passed before Calvary worked toward the reality of that one great day when the Lord Jesus would lay down his soul a ransom for many. You can sense almost the excitement and the anticipation of the Lord Jesus in Hebrews when the Spirit quotes him as saying, At the Incarnation, I come, O Lord, to do thy will, a body thou hast prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices thou hast had no pleasure, but I come, O God, to do thy will. And you can almost see and hear in that 
quote of the Lord Jesus, the anticipation of the great day for which he came from an eternity past into human history and in, in the presence of the people. When the high priest appeared on the great day of atonement, before his appearance before the people, <clears throat> he took off his garments of glory. The priests had garments of glory. Only the high priest could wear them. Only the anointed, the consecrated priest, could wear those garments. There was a golden mitre inscribed with the words, Holiness to the Lord. There was a linen garment or coat which covered his body. There was the blue coat of the ephod which came over his shoulders like a tunic. There was that wonderful breastplate with twelve manner of precious stones set on the front of it. And in each of those twelve stones was engraved the name of one of the twelve tribes of Israel. On each shoulder was an onyx stone. On each onyx stone six names of six tribes of the children of Israel. These were his garments of glory. These were the high priestly garments given to him of God. No man on earth besides Aaron could wear those garments. No man but Aaron could approach God with such glorious garments as those. But on the great day of atonement, his first appearance on that day was without the garments of glory. He removed them and clothed himself in the common clothing of the common priest. Pure linen garment, a linen hat, linen breeches, and a linen girdle. He looked just like any other priest on that day. He looked just like any other of the other men who ministered in the tabernacle area. And so we have a wonderful picture of the first appearance of the Lord Jesus in the human race. God had given him glory. He had glory with God before the foundation of the world. But when he entered the human race, he laid aside the garments of his glory. He laid aside the outward signia of his, in, of his majesty. He laid aside the outward adornments of the deity which he wore in the glory with God. And he clothed himself like any other man. And the book of Hebrews comments on this wonderful truth of incarnation, that we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory, and all of this that he might taste death by the grace of God for every man. He was not made in the likeness of angels, but he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And when he appeared on the earthly scene to the outward appearance, he looked just like any other man, clothed in the same garments of flesh without the sin nature, and appeared on the great day of atonement to be just like any other man. But all his garments were indeed different. For he had no need to wash his flesh before that day. And his purity was intrinsic. It was his own. He needed not to make any sacrifice for himself. There is no fulfillment in the work of Calvary of the sacrifice which the high priest made for himself and his house. Christ needed not 
the writer of Hebrews said, to offer up sacrifices like those other priests for himself and for his house. For he was holy and harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners and had no need to make sacrifice for himself. This man took off willfully the form of God. For being found in the form of God, he had never thought it robbery to be like God, but gladly and willfully and joyfully humbled himself and became obedient unto the death of the cross. The very first appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ is when he appeared in the human race, stripped of the garments of glory and clothed in the likeness of common man. And then he began his work. One of the significant things about the work of this priest, which I've been touching on in the last two messages, is the fact that all his work was done alone. No man could help him. No man could contribute to that work. No man could add anything to that work. The nation must stand by on that day and watch it. No priest assisted him. The ministry had no part of the work of atonement. There was no one allowed to participate in the work of redemption on that day, save that one man. It was all his work and his work alone. So it was with the Lord Jesus. We must stand by and accept this great truth that the work of redemption is his alone. No man can add to it. No man can help him. No man can contribute. Jesus came and appeared in the human race and did what he did in his atoning work alone. The disciples did not help him. Man did not help him. He was utterly and absolutely alone in all of his work. And if you will read carefully again with this in mind, the story of the Lord Jesus' life and his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you will see that no man had anything to do with his atoning work. Even when he went into Gethsemane, he went alone. He took his disciples as far as the gate. He bid them tarry there while he go on into the garden alone and there wrestle before God with this great cup which was revealed to him in the garden, shown to be holding the sins of the world and the penalty and the wrath that was due to that sin. There in Gethsemane, he was alone in the agony and in the sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. He was alone, alone before God when he cried out, Oh, if there be any way for this cup to pass, then let it pass but not as I will, but as thou wilt. He was alone before the people. He was alone before Pilate. He was alone when he went to, Geth to Calvary, and he was alone when they crucified him. He was alone, no man with him, when he hung on that cross and in his own body bare our sins on the tree. He was alone when God made him to drink that cup, and he made him sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was alone in that darkness for three hours, and he was alone when he died, and he was alone when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he was alone when he descended into the deep, he was alone when his soul went into the pit 
and he was alone when, like that scapegoat, he went into the uninhabited place and left the sins of the world. He was alone when God raised him from the dead, and he alone went into heaven with his own blood, and he by himself purged us from our sins and sat down at the right hand of God. And when he comes in glory, and the nation sees his garments stained with sin, with blood, they will ask him how he stained his garments. So Isaiah prophesied, and he will answer them. In that day there was none to stand with me. In that day I trod the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God alone. There was none to help, he said. And so I want you to never forget this. The high priest worked alone. And do you realize, I didn't realize it until today when I was thinking over this great day of atonement, that there was so much involved on that day, not only the offering of the two goats, not only the bullet for himself, not only the bird offering, but all of the regular sacrifices of that day had to be offered as well. The lamps had to be trimmed just as usual. The fire had to be kept burning on the altar just as usual. And all of the work which had previously been done on the days before by other priests fell also upon him so that he gathered up the work of all priests for all time. And on the great day of atonement he performed it all himself. And all of the hopes of those people were pinned on that one man's ability to do what God had consecrated him to do. And all the hopes of all the sinners in the world tonight are pinned on the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ to do what God consecrated him and anointed him to do. This is where salvation by grace through faith comes in. We stand by as sinners worthy of death, confessing by our very consent to his sacrifice that one needs die for us. And we stand by with nothing more and nothing less to do than believe in that priest. They believed in him. All their hopes were pinned on him. They believed God had called him, and they believed he was able. And they waited from sun up on the great day of atonement until sundown for the completion of his work and believed that he, by the grace of God, would be able to accomplish what he had set out to accomplish. This is exactly how we are saved. And uh, I, I give you this little illustration because uh, it will help explain to you why I repeat so much. One of the great preachers of a generation ago, when he lay dying, was asked this question, what has been the secret of your ministry? He had had a very powerful ministry. Now, a powerful ministry is not measured in numbers. A powerful ministry is measured in this manner. His ministry had been used of God to reach and change the lives of others. When he taught, people were taught. When he preached, people listened. Their hearts were moved and touched, and the word was alive when preached through him. And he said, if I have any secret of success, it has been one thing, repetition, repetition, 
repetition, repeating over and over and over again the facts of the glorious gospel of Christ. And this is the success of all preaching, is repetition, repetition, repetition. And I repeat tonight, if you are not tonight trusting wholly, resting, for rest is the result of trust, and if you are not resting wholly in a work which this priest of ours has done, is doing, and will do, then you are not a saved person tonight. If you are hoping that your works will have some part of it, if you are hoping that your merits will enter into it, if you are hoping that your righteousness will help influence God as to your soul, you are still in your sin. You are still unsaved. And the fruit of salvation is a blessed rest. For when we get to the end of Leviticus 16, you will see that the great day of atonement for the people was the Sabbath of rest. And he told those people, you shall not do any work at all, nor the strangers in your house. No man must do any work on this day. It shall be a Sabbath of rest for you. If you want to do something, God says, this is what you shall do. Afflict your soul. And the word afflict means to look down upon, to browbeat, to subdue, and to suppress. And the only thing I have ever found able to do in the presence of the finished work of Christ is to look upon my soul and realize that all that he did there for me, he did because of what I see in my own soul. He did because I was a sinner. And that high priest working. And I think of these people standing there watching him throughout that day. The sweat standing out on his brow. They saw the weariness in his eyes and in his face. They saw him as he labored throughout that day for them. They saw that they could do nothing. And they must have stood in a holy silence and afflicted their souls, for they knew no work of man could help him, and they knew no work of man was acceptable with God, and they knew that if they were saved at all, and if atonement was made at all, and if redemption became a fact, that man had to do it. And that's plainly and simply the gospel of Christ. And it's what Paul meant when he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I know that I have trusted him, for I have ceased from my works to rest in his. Say, so don't Christians do any work? Of course they do work. But they don't do any works for salvation. Not believers. For if any man, the book of Hebrews argues, is still carrying upon him the burden and guilt of his sin, and is still endeavoring by dead works to serve God, the book of Hebrews plainly teaches that he has never rested in the sacrifice of Christ. For to rest in Christ is to cease from all efforts on our own to establish our righteousness in the sight of God. Now there was a time when I did work to save my soul, a time when I tried to work to save my soul. There was a time when you did also, 
when we went about trying to establish our own righteousness, ignorant that God had already given righteousness in Christ, as Paul says in Romans 10. I remember how diligently and sincerely and earnestly I promised God to do work if he would forgive me of my sins. I remember how diligently I thought and endeavored to do those works and how consistently I failed and how through all of that endeavor I was never relieved of a guilty conscience. I tried and failed, tried and failed. I promised and broke my promises. I wept until there were no more tears to shed, and nothing could avail, and nothing could move God to speak peace to my soul, until I rested in this. Jesus died for me. He is the Savior. I accept him. I trust him. I bring my burden to him. I bring my weary soul to him. Here I cease, and here I rest. And that's when peace came, and conscience was purged, and rest filled my soul as he promised. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the more you study Leviticus 16, the more you see that the people couldn't do anything couldn't say anything, didn't have any part of it. It just simply was not of works, lest any man should boast. If there was anyone to be praised and anyone to be thanked and anyone to be loved for the atonement that became theirs, it was that priest who was permitted to come to the presence of God and do what God had outlined could be done for the forgiveness of the people's sins. Now, after he appeared in his linen garments, he killed the sin sacrifice. This is what we'll hear about Wednesday night. My message Wednesday night will be on the sin sacrifice. He killed that sin sacrifice. He cut his blood in a basin, and he carried that blood into the tabernacle building. He went back to the great veil and parted that veil and went into the Holy of Holies. And there, without word, without sound, for the blood spoke all that was spoken that day. He sprinkled the mercy seat in the presence of God seven times with the blood of the sin sacrifice. In the ninth chapter again of Hebrews, at the 11th and 12th verses, Paul says, But Christ, arriving on the scene as an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own unique blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The high priest appeared in his linen garments before the people. They witnessed the sacrifice of that priest, and then he disappeared. So with our great high priest. He came and appeared in the likeness of man. Man witnessed his sacrifice, and he disappeared. He went into the deep, but as God had promised David, and as Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, God did not leave his soul in hell, nor did he suffer his Holy One to see corruption. But he raised him from the dead, made this Jesus to be both Lord and Christ, 
And this high priest who had disappeared from the view of man appeared in the presence of God. In his hands he brought the precious blood he shed. I'm not going to fuss and argue with anybody over the ninth chapter of Hebrews, verse 12. I'm going to tell you that it means exactly what it says, that the Lord Jesus Christ literally went into the literal heaven and into the literal tabernacle of heaven and to the literal mercy seat in the presence of a literal God and sprinkled his literal blood on a literal mercy seat. Amen. If you want to accuse me of something, then accuse me of being too literal. For I believe what God says. He took that blood. Listen, that blood was not like the blood of Adam. Had it been like Adam's blood, it would have corrupted and gone back to the dust from whence it came. That blood never came from dust, and that blood never came from earth. That blood came from heaven, and Paul said it was the blood of God himself. Now, you figure that out. I can't. I just know what the Bible says. And Peter says the blood is incorruptible, and if it's incorruptible, it is not a part of earth nor is it a part of creation. It is incorruptible, eternal, and the book of Hebrews declares that the Holy of Holies and the throne of God is now sprinkled with a freshly slain sacrifice's blood. And that precious and freshly slain sacrifice is Christ. And that incorruptible blood is on that mercy seat. And Jesus took it there himself when he disappeared from the view of man. Mary almost caught him in the garden that morning when she would have laid hold of him. And he said, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Yet a few hours later he said, Handle me and see. I am flesh and blood. Why did he not want Mary to touch him? Because he was in the garments of the priesthood, and he was on his way, consecrated and set apart under the sprinkling of the mercy seat, and he was on his way to present his blood in heaven before God. And the book of Hebrews, again chapter 9, verse 12, tells us that when this precious blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, he obtained. And the Greek says he found something he had sought for a long time. And I'll tell you what it was. Eternal redemption for us. How long had he looked for it and sought for it? He sought it since the day in the eternity past that he was marked out as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He sought it, that means that everything in eternity leading up to the cross was looking forward to that one great day of atonement. He appeared before man in the likeness of common man, and he made his sacrifice, and he disappeared, and we wouldn't know where he went, nor what he did, had God not written it in the Old Testament Scriptures, verified it in the New. He went behind the veil, and he took the blood, and he sprinkled heaven's mercy seat. And then what did he do? <laughs> well, what did the priest do on the great day of atonement? He came out again. Oh, I like that part, don't you? Well, he had a little something to do, and we'll straighten this out on Wednesday night, we hope, or at least by next Sunday morning. But he came out again. With blood-sprinkled hands, he came out again, still in the garment that manifested in the likeness of common man. But when he came out, he came out to show the people something. He came out to show the people in a symbolic act what his work inside that veil had done. He laid his hands on that scapegoat. He confessed all the sins and all the iniquities and all the transgressions of the people on him. 
and he sent him away into an uninhabited place. And it was the priest's way of telling the people that their sins had been carried away and they were gone forever from the presence of God. Our high priest came back at the resurrection. And as far as I can see, the most important thing he did when he appeared the second time to his disciples was to show his wounded hands and side and say, Peace be unto you. It was his way of saying, Look at your scapegoat. The sins are gone. They are gone. Now, I repeat this, repetition, repetition, repetition. What does the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ mean? Does it simply mean that men live after they die? No. Lazarus proved it, as well as five others before him. Does it simply prove that Christ was victorious over the forces of evil? No, it does not. It proves what Paul in the book of Romans ascribed to the resurrection. When he appeared alive, when he appeared with the marks of the cross still in his hands and feet and thighs, they were the proof positive that he was the same Jesus that died at that cross. It proved that he was the same one who bore their sins in his own body on the tree. It proved that he was the sacrifice offered to God. And the fact that he was alive after facing God in judgment with our sins was proof positive that God had been satisfied forever with his offerings and that our sins were gone. For if they had not been taken away, he would have still had them in his body on resurrection morning. And he didn't have them. And when they saw him standing there and were assured that it was he himself, and they saw those wounds in his hands and thighs, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And they had peace they had never had before because for the first time they had peace with God. And I'll tell you when the people had peace. I know when God was satisfied, and I know when he looked upon the blood, and I know when eternal redemption was obtained, but I'll tell you when the people had peace, when they saw that scapegoat leave, and they knew that there went their sins, they were gone forever. And I don't think there was a cry of rejoicing ever raised from that camp till the dust of that scapegoat had settled. The priest knew he had the assurance before he saw the scapegoat, but the people knew when they saw that scapegoat. And the disciples knew when they saw Jesus on the resurrection day. They knew. Now, in the, the book of Leviticus again, he appeared to the people, then he disappeared. He went behind the veil and made his offering. Then he appeared and the people saw him again. And the book of Hebrews, the passage we read tonight, says that he is now, at this present time, appearing in the presence of God for us. He appeared once in the end of the ages. The world saw him, handled him, as John said, witnessed his sacrifice, and he disappeared. He is now absent from our view. He is in heaven tonight, and he is appearing in the presence of God for us. He has his garments of glory on now. 
He has changed his linen breeches for the garments of glory. And on his breastplate tonight, and on his shoulders, are engraved in the name of the people he represents in heaven. That priest went into the Holy of Holies to represent those people whose names were on his breastplate. And all the people whose names were on his breastplate. This is an encouraging word to my own poor heart tonight. And it's a word that has bolstered me more times than I could tell you. That when we get discouraged, and when we get afraid, for we get both of those things, and when the world and the flesh and the devil seems to have gained a victory over us, we remember that appearing in the very presence of God for me is my high priest accepted and on his breast the place of affection and upon his shoulder the place of strength and power is my name and night and day before the very throne of God my name is presented in the accepted person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you think about that. Now I want to close with this observation of what the priest did. He appeared, and then he disappeared. Then he came back sent the scapegoat away, and they saw him. Then we read in Leviticus 16, verse 23, Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle, and he shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, and put on his garments, and come forth. Now, dispensationally, this is where we are tonight. The Lord Jesus, after the sacrifice of his finished work, after eternal redemption had been obtained, after he had shown himself in the presence of the people to assure them of an acceptable work, he disappeared again. Like Aaron, he went back into the tabernacle to stay until he put off his linen clothes, put on his garments of glory, and then he will come forth. He's in that tabernacle tonight. He has put on the garments of glory. John got a glimpse of him on the Isle of Patmos, and we're waiting for him tonight to come forth. <coughs> I wish you could uh, think of those people again for just a moment. They gathered at the door of the congregation, and they waited all the live long day for that priest. They must have stood in silence, expectantly, hopefully, their emotions rising and falling with the events of the day. They see him come out to the brazen altar and kill that sin sacrifice. They see him gather up the blood, and they see him leave. He goes back yonder into the tabernacle for a season. Later he comes out, his hand sprinkled with blood, lays his hand upon the scapegoat, gives him to a fit man to take away into an uninhabited place. Then they see him disappear from view again. And he stays a long time, for he must wash. He must take off his linen garments. He must put on his garments of glory. And then he will come forth. They are waiting for him to come forth. For when he comes forth, the great day of atonement is completed. And they see him as he really is. And I read in one place where the Jews waited because they wanted to see that priest 
and they crowded around him when he came forth to thank him and to congratulate him on his successful ministry for them. Now think for just a moment, holding what you have there, of that priest at the end of the day. One man figured out I didn't. But he looked through the law and through the orders of the Levitical sacrifices. And he found that in the course of the great day of atonement, not only had that high priest trimmed those lamps, refueled them with oil, kept the sacrificial fires burning all day long by himself, but he had offered somewhere between 15 and 17 distinct sacrifices during the day. Besides the changing of garments, the washing of his flesh, the going in and out of the tabernacle, the sprinkling of the altar, the sprinkling of the labor, the sprinkling of the internal offering, the sprinkling of the mercy seat, the offering of the incense, the filling of the censer, the firing of that incense on the altar. All of these things he had laboriously done throughout the day. And at the end of his finished work, he comes forth washed and clothed in glorious garments and gives himself to the people. They thank him. They are grateful for what he has done. They congratulate him. They gather around him at sundown when the great day of atonement is over. And I ask myself today, I wonder what they did after sundown. I think I know. I think they sat down and priests and people talked about the great atonement which had been worked that day for Israel. You see, supper wasn't eaten until late with the Jewish people. Their supper sometimes didn't begin until 10 in the evening. For the day ended at sundown. The family was never together until the sun had gone down and all of the men had come in from the field and the food had been prepared and it was more than just a time to eat. It was a time of fellowship, a time of communion, and a precious time when the family got together and shared together their common experience. Now this is where we are dispensationally. The Lord Jesus is in the tabernacle. He has already put on his garments of glory. And we are like the people of old. We are waiting at the outer gate. And we are waiting for him to come forth. And when he comes forth, we are going to see him as he is. We won't see him in the likeness of sinful flesh. We will see him without sin apart from sin unto salvation. And we will see him with the garments of the glory on. And like the people of old, I want to thank him and congratulate him and fall at his feet and tell him how glad I am that he was God's anointed and that he did this work of atonement for me. Well, the priest has gone back into the tabernacle. The people are waiting. This must have been the most suspenseful moment of the day when they watched for the rustling of that veil and the appearance of that priest to bless them on the grounds of a finished work. And they must have grown a little impatient as they waited and the sun sunk lower and lower in the west. How did they know that he was still in there and that he was alive and that he really was going to come out and that they were really going to see? Well, he had bells around the hem of his garment, if you remember. They could hear those bells. The only sound they could hear while he was in the tabernacle. They heard those bells. Now, bells are the type of testimony. They give a ringing sound, a ringing testimony. 
And every time the priest's body moved, the bells rang. And the people could hear those bells ringing, and they were assured their priest was there, that he was alive, and that he would come out, and they would see him, and they would embrace him. Now Christ is in the glory tonight, but he has a body. You remember? All who are saved are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And the body tonight is moving. And every time it moves on earth by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is the ringing testimony to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. For this body is alive with his life. And their testimony is his testimony. For he said, The Holy Spirit shall testify of me. And wherever the body is tonight, and wherever they are moved by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ringing testimony and assurance that the Lord Jesus is in the glory, and that he will come forth someday, and we will see him. I tell you that the more you think about that, the more you will become convinced that the movements of the body are the great assurance tonight of the presence of Christ in the presence of God. For he is the head of that body, and all he is doing through that body, by that body, for that body, and in that body he does by his resurrected life and by his acceptance at the throne of God. And I tell you that we look toward heaven tonight with world events what they are, and they are unrelated to the rapture as we know, but with world events as they are, where else is there to look but up? We dare not look down and we dare not look around. We dare not look within. Let us look up and let us keep our eye on the veil of heaven's tabernacle. For Hebrews tells us that Christ is even that veil. And let us keep our eyes looking toward heaven for the appearance of our great God and Savior, who shall appear the second time without sin. And we shall see him as he really is, and we will embrace him and thank him for his finished work in our behalf. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for thy word and for the Lord Jesus, thy Son. What else can we say than that which has been said to be all the praise and the glory and the honor belong? Help us to ascribe all this praise to you. Send quickly our high priest. It's been a long day. We've seen him appear through the eyes of faith. We watched him make his sacrifice at the brazen altar. We've watched him by faith as he took that blood to your presence and sprinkled your mercy seat. We've seen him by faith as he appeared among the people and assured them that sins were gone. And oh, we long now to see him come forth from the tabernacle of heaven at the end of this great day of atonement. We want to embrace him and to sit at his feet and hear him tell what it was like when he went into your presence for us. And to hear him tell what it was like when he obtained eternal redemption. To hear what it was like when he went away in the wilderness and took our sins with him. To hear him tell what it was like when he died at Calvary for us. God grant that we may see him soon, and our prayer tonight can only be, even so come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this blessed Lord's day. We don't know of a better way to spend it than the way we have spent it. We look around us, Father, tonight, and the world is in ruins. Yea, it is in flames, going down to a Christless eternity. We see the leaders of our country and the leaders of the countries of the world making 
mockery of sin and merchandise of the lives of men. We see, Lord, the hopeless involvement of man with man, and we see Antichrist coming swiftly to the scene. We see judgment on the horizon and the coming of Christ from the glory and in the glory to set up his righteous kingdom to be a soon reality. And we know that before these events must take place, he will come for us. Father, send him soon that we may see him and may be delivered from the very power of sin for eternity. <coughs> Make this message real in our hearts and do thy work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.